Andrew is one of Australia's most highly respected investigative journalists. He's worked on the flagship current affairs programs of both public broadcasters. He's held senior news limited roles throughout his career. And he first interviewed Julian Assange for Foreign Correspondent in 2010, for which the program won the New York Festival Gold Medal. He's just updated his 2011 book about Julian Assange, The Most Dangerous Man in the World, which we are going to be hearing more about today. We're really, really excited about that. And tonight, Andrew's going to be in conversation with Mary Kostakidis. Mary presented SBS World News nightly for almost two decades, and in 2019, she visited Julian Assange in Belmarsh Prison. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Fowler and Mary Kostakidis. Thank you, James. Well, WikiLeaks founder and uh, publisher Julian Assange has been in Belmarsh maximum security prison since April last year. He faces extradition to the United States where he'd be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, charges attracting 175 years in prison. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks have received scores of awards for journalism uh, and human rights. Uh, and uh, including the coveted Australian Walkley for most outstanding contribution to journalism. And we're going to be talking about the most dangerous man in the world with Andrew Fowler. Andrew, the, um, the title is an acknowledgement of Julian's, among other things, of his impact. How would you describe that impact? Now, Mary, I think it's difficult to underestimate the impact that WikiLeaks had when it really burst on the public scene in 2010. Who can forget being in the helicopter, gunship, hovering over that Baghdad square and seeing the people below and hearing the pilots talking as though it was like a, um, a game show that they were running, talking about lining people up and then, and then killing them including two writers and journalists. Now that hit home very hard around the world. A couple with that you had the release later on in the same year, and that was the collateral murder video, of course. Uh, you had later on in the year the release of the Afghan war logs, the Iraq war logs, and Cablegate. And it just ripped off the scab of what the Americans and their allies are doing in the Middle East. The torturing, the killing, the body counts of people who died in Iraq. The UK and the US said that they weren't counting the dead civilians. They were, WikiLeaks revealed that 610,000 people died as a result who were non-combatants in Iraq alone. So that's part of the punch through that WikiLeaks brought to us all those years ago, it's a decade ago. And I think that when you look today and look back and say, what was the impact? I think that when The Guardian ran those stories, page after page after page of the atrocities of the WikiLeaks cables were exposing, as did Le Monde, other newspapers, and um, the Spiegel. Journalists looked at those stories and saw them and saw the truth that had been hidden from us as journalists, maybe because we hadn't pushed back hard enough, also because governments have been very good at covering their tracks. But more importantly, it gave us a contemporary view of the world. We didn't have to wait for 20, 30 years to find out the truth of what our foreign policy colleagues have been up to. We didn't have to put up with the censorship. It was there, raw data, for you to make up your mind, and particularly for the readers, and the viewers to make up their mind about what they thought. There's no filter in the way. No one stood in the way of this information. You could read the newspaper story, you could read the document, and you, the reader, could make up your mind. It was revolutionary. Um, I think science called it scientific journalism. I mean, it may well be called scientific journalism, but really it's just journalism that the reader should be given access to as much people, as many people as possible, and WikiLeaks made that, made that possible. And that was the big punch through moment, I suppose, I would say. And of course, what allowed him to do it was the internet and his own commitment to social justice and, and, uh, and his, his searing intelligence, really. 
you know, with his searing intelligence, um, got him into a lot of trouble, as you'll appreciate, as people didn't appreciate Julian's searing intelligence. But, um, some people at the Guardian weren't very happy with his searing intelligence, but his commitment to human rights and to disclosing unpalatable public truths were what drove him. And I think that we as journalists um, should be more supportive of him than we are now because of what he taught us. And one of the reasons he's seen as such a danger, of course, by some uh, powerful governments is because of the capacity for endless revelations. One, it, wasn't, it wasn't like the Pentagon Papers where you have, you know, publish, you, you reveal this, you know, these terrible things that have been happening during the Vietnam War that were concealed from us, uh, the fact that we knew, knew the war was, was going to be lost. This was really the, having this uh, uh, capacity to upload anonymously meant that sources would be encouraged and this might keep happening. The major reason why the United States is persecuting Julian Assange is for that very reason they don't want anybody to follow in his footsteps. They try not just to silence him, but to silence the idea. And we're also culpable, that's Australia as well, and the other so-called Five Eyes countries in clamping down on, on journalists because of that very point that you make. And I think the idea of, of eternally revealing information in a, con a contemporary time um, is extremely dangerous to governments. They don't want people to know what's going on contemporaneously. Also, Assange guaranteed he'd protect sources with an anonymizer. And so far, nobody has been exposed by WikiLeaks as a result of the information they've had there. Uh, you say in the book, in fact, that um, uh, this is not true, that the, the constant assertion that these publications have hurt people, that people have died. Uh, in fact, you say WikiLeaks was on occasion more careful than the mainstream media. Let me give you an example of that. I mean, let's go back to collateral murder, which is the gunship hovering over the Baghdad Street. Um, I would suggest that any journalists um, around the world, there'll be few of them who wouldn't, if they're TV reporters, um, grab that video and put it to air pretty much as you would, um, as you got it, once you established it was it was uh, accurate. What WikiLeaks did was to actually send somebody, Christian Harrison, who's now WikiLeaks editor, to Baghdad to check out the veracity of that information. Now, I think that that's a commitment to public service journalism, the like of which we probably wouldn't see in, in today's modern age. Um, that's a very good point because Julian, in fact, um, has been discredited because of this myth that he is not a journalist. Uh, numerous myths, in fact, that have been attacks on his reputation, both professionally and uh, and personally. Um, another criticism was that he was holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy to avoid Swedish justice, to avoid the sex charges. Well, sure. I mean, that's the uh, it's the beginning of the smear campaign, or maybe it's kind of, uh, maybe fifteen percent into the smear campaign. I mean, Assange told me personally that he believed the Americans would try to extradite him, and uh, he was keen to 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 stay out of the United States for as long as possible. And we now know that in two thousand and ten there was a grand jury sitting, investigating, drawing up charges to to bring him. To America. So they were the charges because there never were any Swedish charges. No, those were the real. Why were there never any Swedish charges? Well, there were real, the real intent was to just get him in some way and to grab him. Um, there were no, well, the charges were never, never revealed because the evidence was so thin, in my opinion. Uh, it's my understanding in Swedish law you know, and, and extradition law that if you want to extradite somebody and you, you must charge them. Um, once they get to the country. But the problem is that Assange wanted that Assange was was being kept in the dark about the charges because there weren't any, because they hadn't gone through the process of gathering the evidence. And they didn't come from London with honest intent to actually investigate, to 
once they'd reached the stage of forming the charges, then they would have to then reveal just how thin the evidence was against him. And that's why the whole thing came to a standstill. And during that time, those eight years in the embassy, and, and since then, um, he's, he's been the subject of a relentless campaign. Nils Melzer, the UN rapporteur, uh, special rapporteur on torture, has been a, a tremendous advocate for Julian's predicament. I think he has indeed. I mean, Nils Melzer is one of the, one of the great uh, investigators of torture. He's, 20 years investigating torture around the world. And Nelson, when he saw a scientist who went into the embassy and saw him, he said he, he said he was really psychologically being tortured. And he said also, I think quite crucially, that he'd never seen so many powerful countries gang up on one individual and try to destroy them. Well, it's quite extraordinary that the reporter on torture would say that about the United States, Australia, in the UK, Canada, and New Zealand, and to say that they would gang up to put him away. And he thought that not only is Assange being tortured, he should be released and compensated. And what happened, of course, is that the British government said, this is wrong, we don't accept that, we appeal. So they appealed, and the United Nations investigated and found that Niels Metz's findings were absolutely watertight and absolutely first class and right. Andrew, another criticism is that he's uh, been a Russian tool and that he's responsible for the election of uh, Donald Trump. You say in the book that uh, the revelation that Bernie Sanders was cheated out of the Democrat nomination should have further elevated WikiLeaks to the pantheon of great journalism. Now, uh, really he's going on inside. Somebody hasn't, who's listening hasn't muted their mics. Can I just ask you, you're sitting at home or in this room, you haven't muted your mic, please do so. Yeah, so they were saying that, um, you know, and these are journalists in Australia as well, they were saying, were quite angry because they supported Hillary Clinton and they thought Trump would be a disaster, personally. I thought Trump would be a disaster as well. But had I been given those documents, had any journalist been given those documents which show that inside the Democrat Party, Sanders was being stitched up and everybody was being given a leg up for the presidency, I would have thought um, I would publish the would publish documents. What journalist in their right mind wouldn't do that? And yes, such is the such is the hatred of Trump, it blinds journalists to what their duty is, which is to reveal without fear or favour the truth that the public's got a right to know. Uh, and quite frankly, I think that people that out there, Hillary Clinton, would have lost the election. I think the party was so divided, the way they treated Sanders was so appalling, and people knew it anyway outside. This was just confirmation. But it's another excuse to You make it very clear in the book that you, you thought it was the principle thing um, to do. Mm. Uh, let's move on from the, the, the myths about you and, and the, these um, assertions to some of the new material in your book that you've just updated. Tell us what you found out about the deal that Waldman tried to, uh, to broker and, and the context of it and what happened. Well, Adam Waldman, who's uh, a rather interesting character, has been described as um, being like Forrest Gump with a brain. He actually turns up at the most unexpected times. And he came, he came up to the embassy, met with the WikiLeaks people, and broke a meeting with a person from the Department of Justice, um, Kaufman, David Kaufman, who was head of counterintelligence. And they were having this backwards and forwards discussion about how to deal with um, the issue of Julian's confinement. And, and the Americans, that's the Department of Justice, were actually saying, well, what, what would Julian do? How would he help? And the discussion, as far as I understand it, went something like this, that um, Corbyn said, well, you know, well, what could you offer? And they said, well, Julian would, would actually be able to say who was not the leaker. In other words, he probably explained what he said before, which is, 
wasn't it wasn't the Russian state and it wasn't the state actor. Well, he may, he may have even given some evidence. And some evidence, exactly. But pointing away from, not pointing to sources, not revealed sources. And what happens subsequent to that is that the discussion had moved on to, well, what do you want? Well, but Julian would be given free passage from the embassy. Would he go to America or not? That's the question. I mean, he probably thought it probably wasn't a good idea, but they were talking about those, those kind of things. And you then go back a few months to, this is in mid-2017, like a few months, and interestingly enough, um, the FBI director, Comey, when he learned of these negotiations, these discussions, said they should stop. This was relayed to Warman, Warman, and through, through Luffman, to, to Warman, and they decided, Luffman said, we're not gonna stop, we're gonna go on, and they carried on. Because what was, at stake here, as far as the Americans were concerned, was the release of um, documents called Vault 7, and they were the inside workings of the CIA. And they fell into two tranches, and the first lot, when they were released, caused not much of a flutter, but they were very concerned about the second lot. And so Julian has these documents that are extremely powerful and revelatory, and at that very moment, um, in the weeks leading up to the eventual release of them, there was a change of, of leadership in Ecuador. And the person who the party was elected, was re-elected, um, that had uh, helped him get asylum, but that had a change of president. And the president, the new president, was very close to the Americans. The Americans were, were leaning on him. Pence had been there, um, the vice president, and the IMF had done a deal, and the Americans were there, well, with their military. And Julian could feel the the net closing, and he, as far as I understand, and he's told me before, he believes in releasing for the maximum powerful impact. That's what he owes the people who blow the whistle and give him documents. And so he thought, I would say, the net's closing, I've got to get this stuff out, and he did. And when he launched Vault 7, it did go like an exorcist missile straight through the middle of the CIA, because it revealed Really crucially, if you unpick it, what it revealed was that the United States had been spying on China. The CIA had been penetrating Chinese industrial complexes, factories, and doing doing to the Chinese what the Americans say the Chinese do to them. So that was a crucial point. Pompeo went completely ballistic with this former CIA director and accused WikiLeaks of being a um, hostile intelligence agency. In fact, um, you also detail in the book uh, the spying on Julian Assange and his lawyers in the embassy by uh, the very party that's prosecuting him. So um, just take us through how this came to pass and, uh, and the role of Cassandra Fairbanks. Yeah, well, what's interesting is following that, um, you can imagine that um, uh, things got a little tighter in the embassy. And the... Um, an organisation called UC Global, Undercover Global, they're based in, in Spain, had a contract to basically run CCT cameras, um, like this year, now any large installation in Sydney, um, to, for security purposes, stop break-ins, things like that. Well, suddenly in about 2015, they started installing um, cameras that could record sound inside the embassy, so well, the question, and also microphones, and they recorded conversations between Assange and his lawyers in great detail and funneled them back to Madrid. And then through a special splitting of the computer server, they gave one lot to the Americans and the other lot went to the Ecuadorian government. And so the, the split that went to the Americans gave uh, basically a, a complete 24 hour run down of everything that happened inside the embassy. Now, who the Americans were is not, it's not clear to be able to say exactly who they were, but by piecing together the information, as I've done going through passing many pages of transcripts like every member, um, you can see that the information made its way all the way to the State Department. And how do we know that? Because, wouldn't you mentioned before, journalists 
called Cassandra Fairbanks. She was an interesting character. She'd actually been a Bernie Sanders supporter. And then when Bernie had been so badly treated, she jumped across to Trump. And of course, the Trump camp welcomed this, uh, you know, this refugee from the left with open arms. And so she had great contacts with the, with the Trump campaign, um, including a guy called Arthur Schultz, who's a rather, I think it'd be kind to say, um, I could rather embrace it for the media as a, as a head kicker. And um, so she got on very well with Arthur, and um, Arthur would talk to her. So when Arthur told her things, she then told Julian, because she was a great supporter of Julian, Sarge. And when Arthur learned that she'd been talking to Julian, he was less than happy and told her so, extremely unhappy. You've told him all these things, I can't talk to you anymore, I can't trust you. The question is, how did, how did Arthur know that she'd been talking to Julian? He said, by the way, there's a big investigation of State Department, some people, my best friends, are under a microscope. How did he know that? How did he know that she'd been talking to Assange and what she'd said? The loop had been closed if the State Department had access to the information. And what's significant about that is that if the State Department has got access to it and they in any way alert the prosecution to that information, then the argument could be had that the whole case falls in a heap because it's illegal in the United States, I understand, certainly in Europe, to spy on clients and their lawyers. There's a really important point about, about the, the relevance of that information and who had access to it. Well, a lot is going to hinge on British justice, and so far it, uh, it hasn't been promising. We saw during the hearing earlier this year that Julian uh, was barely able to communicate with his lawyers, and indeed all along he hasn't been able to prepare adequately for his case because of uh, hampered access to lawyers, even to documents he needs to read for his defence. Yeah, indeed, and I think the problem with the case, I mean, many, many different problems with the case, including, as you say, Assange not being able to talk to his lawyers, not being able to sit in the court world, being held in the cage like some sort of, I mean, it's Belmarsh prison. This is this is UK's Guantanamo Bay. They were locking people up there you know, in the early 2000s. Um, he's, he has a problem of dealing with the US, so the UK justice, there's a step for you, the UK justice system because the UK justice system is not behaving justly. How can the judge who presides over the entirety of this case, how can she preside over it? That's not the person the hearing, but the person who's actually there, the Lady Arbuthnot. She is related to uh, a member of the House of Lords, her husband, he sat on the um, Security and Intelligence Committee of the UK, he had a business relationship with the former head of MI6, um, and according to the, the rules and regulations that govern which cases you can and can't sit on, she's in complete breach of that. She should have nothing to do with this case. Yes, she, she's compromised, and but also the Office of the Prosecution in the UK compromised themselves, and we know this because of the FOI documents that Stefani Maurizzi obtained. Well, they did indeed. You were referring to the Swedish, uh, Swedish case. case. Yes, well, it's a rather curious matter, isn't it, when the Swedes are pretty much losing interest in the case, mainly because of the internal um, criticism that the prosecuting authority in, the, in the Sweden is coming under. And uh, according to the FI documents, discovered after great work by Stephanie Borazia, who's an Italian journalist, that in those documents she discovered one piece that hadn't been blacked out. And it was simply said, it was a message from the British, from the Crown Prosecutor Service to the Swedes, saying, don't get cold feet. Don't you dare get cold feet, I believe. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> don't you dare get cold feet. What is happening here is that the British are only too keen to get a silent into Swedish custody. Well, that there was pressure from the UK on yes. the Swedes. Yes. Um, just 
moving on, because we've got a lot of material to get through, there's um, there's a new indictment now, but mm. no new charges. No. Um, uh, and it wasn't served to the court, it wasn't served to the defence, it was served by the media. Mm. What do you make of this? Look, it seems to me that the... But it seems to me that the problem here is that the Americans realise that their charge in which they in which they accuse Assange of helping Chelsea Manning get uh, access to a computer system that she had access to legally anyway was so thin and so vulnerable because there was no offence really committed there. There's no offence of, of encouraging Chelsea Manning to break in and do something she wasn't entitled to do. It was to help her hide her identity. So that was the most important thing. I think that this, these charges now are stepping back from that and saying, well, look, if we don't get that one off the ground, then what we'll do is we'll say he stood in the hall and he asked questions of people and said, if you find information out about um, the Americans and what they're up to in the here, they're over us or the British or the Australians or anybody else or the Russians. Please get the information and give it to us on WikiLeaks. So that was what that was what he was actually doing. So they're accusing him now of conspiring and encouraging people to hack computers. It shows to me that the first charge, that this first charge that he was actually held on, when they dragged him out of the embassy, after by the way, after he had exposed the spying, it was the 24 hours that dragged him out. So it strikes me that that's what that's about. It's a catch-all. It's catching up with. The failed first charge it was so weak, um, and I think that that's that's a sign of just the weakness of the case. The problem is that just how low, just the little evidence that's required to get him to the United States. You don't have to prove the case to get him there. You just have to show there's a case to answer, and that is a, that is a problem. Because if Julian Assange ends up in the United States, I think he will be in. In, in, in grave trouble, and 175 years isn't what we're talking about. We've got people there that wanted to, if Biden wins the election, he called Assange a high tech terrorist. I mean, the, 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 the hatred for him will be palpable, and the country, as you can see, is so divided that I don't think it would be possible to get a fair trial, not even in Virginia. Um, Andrew, you and I and, and others uh, can see that there's been a relentless unfolding of an injustice here. Um, uh, uh, yet our, our um, Prime Minister says Julian Lynn should uh, face the music. Uh, and I, I want to ask you why do you think the Australian Government is taking this decision and what should they be doing? Well, he's not alone, by the way, in saying that Julian Assange should face the music. If you go back to 2010, Julian Gillard said that he broke the law to the extent that they called the federal police in. Federal police investigated and found that he's not broken the law. Now, the Attorney General at the time said, I'll take away his passport. And Kevin Rudd, Kevin Rudd said, well, you don't have the right to take away his passport. And by the way, if Assange needs some material to help him in his prison cell, I'll send him a computer. And that's because, you know, this is Rudd actually supporting open government, more open government. And um, he actually lost quite a bit. The WikiLeaks reported a lot of stuff about what Kevin Rudd said about the Chinese, which was extremely embarrassing and unpopular. But having said that, he still stood by, by Assange. If you then roll on to later on, um, Bob Carr, who's now become somebody who says, yeah, enough's enough and Assange should be brought home. He was saying um, that he thought that, uh, uh, that well, Assange had received more than enough consular assistance, more than enough consular assistance, um, more than usual. And then, then he said, no, I didn't actually say that. That was, the, that was because I was getting sick and tired of Christine Assange and I wanted to just basically, you know, pay her out a bit. I mean, what is this about as the foreign minister saying this about somebody just to settle an old score? Then we roll forward to the current incumbents and we've got Scott Morrison saying he just faced the music. And they, the question is almost redundant. Most people would know the answer. The reason that it's like that is because Australia is um, so close to the United States that it daren't, it's terrified, 
terrified of offending the great master. It, sh it is horrified. And so it will do anything not to offend them. And that, and the scientist is like, he's out there. Let's not worry about it. Let's, let's help the public forget about it. If the public forgets about Julian Assange, I think they'll live to regret forgetting about him because I don't think that he will survive if he, end, he ends up in the United States. And that will be on the that will be on the hands of the people, not not just the public, but the politicians who need to have the understanding that the public does support Assange. So what what, what um, Marie is paying our Prime Minister is saying that is that he's receiving consular assistance. He gets the sort of assistance everyone else gets in this situation. Yeah, well, consular assistance is um, is really just, um, as you said before, it's like issuing your passport. It's helping you find your lost train ticket. You know, it's getting the stolen bags or whatever it is. This is not a consular assistance matter. This is a political matter. The government needs to talk to the British, particularly the British, particularly Boris Johnson, who says the extradition relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom is very one-sided. Without going into details, they've got their own problems with other extraditions that they want to bring people back from America. They can't do it. So that's what you need to do. It's a political decision where, where this government says it's a political uh, prosecution and therefore we believe that you should not send him to the United States on the basis that it's a political extradition and under the terms of the uh, treaty, I understand that uh, you can actually make their argument to say it's a political crime you shouldn't be extradited. And we have, Australia has intervened in the past. They've helped uh, James Richardson, Peter Greste, uh, Michelle Corby, who talked about in the book, say if he, if he was a drug runner, we would have sent over a couple of QCs to help. Well, that's exactly what happened with Michelle Corby and John Howard did do that so on her appeal. But the difference is that on one side, you've got Asia and our neighbours, and this is where we really punch down. This is where we flex our mighty muscle in Asia. We can we, we feel we're emboldened to stand up and speak truth to power. We, we, we can deal with that. Can we deal with the United States of America? Absolutely not. Absolutely. We just go to water. I mean, you know, it's, it is extraordinary to, to see a country so craven to another power. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm... I was I migrated to Australia many years ago, and I was told of the great strength of Australian character and spirit, all those things. With the United States, forget it. Forget it. We just give in, whatever they want. Um, Andrew, um, I think we've both been disappointed by the failure of journalists to um, see that Julian Assange has been the canary in the mine. Um, a failure to comprehend the implications and consequences of his persecution and his prosecution. Mm. Um, we're seeing the, the disturbing rise of authoritarianism in Western liberal democracies. Yeah. Uh, governments are enforcing this new social contract which they've snuck up on us. Um, how is it affecting the role of journalists and, um, and more broadly our freedoms? Well... That's a very good question and quite a long one to answer. I'll just make a point that Daniel Ellsberg made about 2010 and he was talking to Julian about these issues of Assange believed that if you could expose the rottenness inside organisations, that they would collapse under the weight of their own criminality. He's a great believer in that. And what Daniel Ellsberg said is, on the contrary, what will happen is they will get tighter and tighter, worse and worse, harder and harder, and more authoritarian. It will be just the reverse. You need to fight against that and be wary of it. But what we've seen is just that. Ever since WikiLeaks, ever since the exposés of 2010, it's become more and more draconian, more and more author authoritarian, and harder and harder and harder for journalists to do their jobs. The government in this country has introduced, I mean, there was no protection for journalists. There's a protection implied in, the, in some of the charges that may have to pass through 
the Attorney General, and he may or may not, or she may or not, may or not decide to prosecute. There are certain sort of certain small things that you, can, you, you might be able to argue in court, but it's up to the court to decide whether or not you're protected. It's absolutely hopeless. There is no real defence. And when you see what happened to the ABC, where the federal police just went in the front door and started rifling through the files of the ABC, this is the ABC. This is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. I mean, this is a, this is an Australian institution, and the federal police are going in and just looking through reporters' notes. I mean, this is extraordinary. This is absolutely extraordinary. And the ABC, to their credit, I mean that they they push back and they, they fought back. But this has been slowly eroding, slowly eroding. The journalists have been too willing to give up, too willing to give in. The ABC, for example, got their hands on several filing cabinets of ASIO documents. And ASIO said, we want them back. What did the ABC do? They gave them back. I can barely believe I'm saying this to you. No journalist will hand back classified or confidential documents until they've been through them and until they've worked out whether or not the public has a right to know information contained in those documents. So the slippery slope, the slide that's coming all the time, ends up with the feds going in the front door and rifling through your files. So the resistance is not too late to resist, to resist this, but it's increasingly difficult. Andrew, I think we're going to take some questions from um, from people who are watching now. Um, uh, oh, okay, um, lots of questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Andrew, does the Democrat presidential win offer any chance of Julian's prosecution being stopped? No, not at all. It's one of the same thing. There is no difference. The only difference would have been Sanders, but um, he was marginalised um, and pushed out the door by the establishment. The Democrat Party, I think, although, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I, don't, I hope that Joe Biden wins. Um, but as for Assange, I think there's no chance of any change. He's uh, the guy who called Assange a high-tech terrorist out there banging the drum. I mean, uh, you can see there are more wars coming. I mean, I think one thing about, I'll be brief, about Trump is that he actually reigned in John Bolton. Pretty good going, I think. I mean, he took Bolton as a last resort, last resort, but he did at least stop him from some of his more insane acts he would have carried out. America would be involved in more wars if Hillary Clinton was president. I'm convinced of that. Uh, there's a, a question about uh, discussing further the global precedent being set by the prosecution. Prosecution, I think they mean of the Assange for press freedom, especially in the light of the threat to prosecute ABC journalist Dan Oakes for exposing war crimes in Afghanistan. Yes. So, so what's the question? So, well, the prosecution set by the the uh, precedent set by prosecuting Julian Assange. If the US can prosecute someone for committing uh, a so-called yeah. crime, not on their, uh, not not in the United States and can have them extradited, yeah. not a United States citizen, uh, no crime committed on US soil, yeah. have them extradited, prosecute them and put them in jail for a threat till yeah. they die. It's a death sentence, really. Yeah. What, what, what's the significance of that precedent? I mean, could, couldn't they then extradite the... Um, Guardian editor. It's, it's a warning to it's a warning to every journalist. In fact, it absolutely is that if you report something that the United States of America decides is not in their national interest, is actually and maybe uses information that they consider to be classified secret, they can extradite you. They can attempt to extradite you, and that has a chilling effect on journalists. So actually, have that fear hanging over them. And that's the reason why the Assange case is so important for journalists. If you don't get it, if you don't, if you didn't get it before, you must get it now. But you're next. But of course, uh, Russ Bridger is not being prosecuted. The, the raids in Australia happened straight after um, Julian was dragged out of the embassy. Um, and David McGuire 
um, mm. tweeted the other day that um, he was aware that uh, Australia consulted the United States before taking action against him and Dan Oates. It wouldn't surprise me because that's uh, that's exactly the intermeshing of the intelligence means that if you're pulling the threads of the intelligence apart, you'll find there'll be threads of American intelligence involved in that story almost certainly, and consequently that is a risk. You know, I mean there's a risk, but also we would tell them, tell the Americans because Australia uses so much American intelligence, so much of the hardware that's used to suck up information is American American control. So they basically have a copyright over this stuff, a lot of it. I'm not sure of the breakdown, but, but, but the majority of it, and the hardware particularly, is American. Um, so you can see which way, is, which way the wind is blowing um, if you're a journalist. Um, I would encourage people not to take any notice of this whatsoever, but to go and do their jobs. But I know that people higher up the command chain will be thinking seriously about bringing on another raid at the ABC uh, because there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fear and it's it's designed to instill fear. In censorship. Censorship, to censor us, to stop us knowing. I mean, for goodness sake, can you imagine what's going on right now that we don't know about when we knew about what was happening in 2010, I mean 2007, only I mean, three years ago? I mean, they don't want, the, that's the United States particularly, particularly the current administration, do not want to have their dirty linen washed in public. Um, there's another question here about the Labour Party. Um, what's Albanese's Labour Party doing now? Do you think anything's going to change if Labour uh, are in power after the next election? Probably not. I wouldn't think so. Labour Party just sticks very closely to the script on intelligence and security. Um, even when it's completely um, vacuous, bonkers, and uh, serves no purpose, um, they just stick with it because you can't criticise the United States. Um, it's impossible, and it's such a it's such a, a dud way of thinking of, of not engaging. You don't. You, you just say nothing. You just follow on slavishly. So you know if we end up with um, the Americans deciding they're going to launch some kind of a cyber attack on, on Taiwan or on, to, to, on China, um, but, uh, you know, we'll be part of it because we're so enmeshed in it. We're so enmeshed in American foreign policy. Um, someone else said that so they're interested in further discussion on the Australian government's uh, response. Uh, could we talk about the difference between the way the Australian government reacted to the detention of journalist Peter Brester in Egypt and the reaction to the um, Assange situation. Of course, they have an excuse, uh, a, a facile excuse with, with Brester because uh, it, it's Egypt and they can write Egypt off as, um, you know, a country uh, where you have to protect your citizen against human rights mm. abuses. Mm. Well, it comes back to the same thing again. It's the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a country that's not that powerful. Um, and um, so, consequently, we can lean on them, and, um, and and the Americans will probably help lean as well. But if Peter Gresler had been picked up in the United States for doing good journalism, he would still be in the United States. He wouldn't be free. And I think Peter Gresler needs to understand that the journalists stood up for him, and 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 they put themselves out to support bringing him back to Australia. And what Peter Gresta did was to write a column saying that June Assange was not a journalist. Now, the importance of that is that without Assange being a journalist, the Americans were prosecuting successfully under the Espionage Act. The thing that stands between Assange and prison in America is his journalism. He has First Amendment protection. It's not guaranteed but it's as good as you're going to get. Without him being a journalist, there is not much protection left. And I think that journalists need to think very clearly before they say that Assange is not a journalist, because it's, it's a death sentence, potentially. Uh, that's a very, very good point, Andrew. And, and also, it's about the changing role of journalism and how, you know, who is a journalist, particularly today? 
Shaw, who is a journalist. I mean, many years ago, it was if you earned half your money as a journalist or as a writer, you could be a journalist. But now people are journalists who publish material, so there are many more journalists than there were before. Um, are they publishing material for the public interest? Yes, then they're journalists. If they're gathering information to give it to a foreign power, then you can prosecute them under the Yes, Bill Watch Act. But Assange has never done that. Assange has always published. He's published material. He's and, a journalist. And he's authenticated. He's, Wikileaks have gone to a lot of trouble to authenticate the material. They've never uh, published anything that's not genuine. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Authenticate everything and, um, and publish what you know to be true, which is pure journalism, um, which goes, goes back to the Hillary the wretched Hillary emails, um, and that's to do with, were they authentic? Yes. Are they in the public interest? Yes. Publish them. That's what we do. Yes, and the, and the most important role of journalism to hold power to account. Because if we're not doing that, then... Well, if we're not holding power to account, we've managed that we're earning a lot more money working for a large organisation that wishes to silence journalism. And there are many of them, and you may work for you may work for a government, for example, who will pay you a lot more money to misrepresent the truth and to journalists who haven't got enough time to check it very often now than you would by being a journalist struggling to hold, as you say, in that cliche, but I think very accurate description of journalism, holding truth to power. Because unless you're doing that, what's the point? Why bother? Why bother being a journalist unless you're doing something like that? Uh, and another question, Assange's lawyer, Dupont Moretti, has become the French uh, foreign minister or justice, no, justice minister. minister? Justice, justice minister. Justice minister, yeah. yes. And um, we know that France has come to Assange was seeking asylum in uh, the two events connected. Well, I think that probably Julian Assange would wish they were, um, but I think that he got the job because he was a rather an outlier. I mean, he's offended. Um, this particular chap offended both left and right in in France um, against the Me Too movement, but wants to see Marine Le Pen's party um, uh, criminalised. So he's got you know so Macron's picked him. But the but the upside for WikiLeaks is that he actually campaigned to get Assad brought to uh, brought to France. And I think that you know if there's an upside to it, then that's it, and uh, you'd be happy to have at least a friend in court rather than an enemy in, a, in an adjacent country. Um, I, I just I want to ask you another question about uh, something you said earlier, Andrew, and that is how we, where we go from here as a society, because if the pressure is going to be on journalists and media organisations to self-censor, uh, and then, and then what, what you're saying is that someone outside, an independent, like Julian Assange, mm. by doing what he's doing, he is making the governments go harder to control the narrative. Mm. Well, where do, how, how do we, how is this resolved? How is this going to be resolved? What's the way forward so that we can have a fairer society? I mean, that there will always be these tensions. There will always be these tensions. We're just moving to an extreme though. Well, I think that the the question about security and national intelligence is it's clear to say that there are some things that are not many. And Paul Barrett, who was previously to say, um, defense here, he said there were a handful of secrets that need to be kept secret. Most of the stuff that's out there, and most of the stuff that WikiLeaks produced, uh, was at a secret level, which is by the way, not a very high level, but governments wish to control every single piece of information. And the problem with the weakened media, because of the way that the internet and Google and Facebook have destroyed the model and advertising has been sucked away, they can't hold um, governments and powerful organisations to account the way, that, the way that they should. How we actually get ahead of that you have to have a system to support public broadcasting, which is why the cuts on the ABC point the finger directly at the way the government wants to run. They want to run down 
They're delighted that newspapers are shocking. They're delighted. They can then put their press releases out and have them read on the net. And there's no one standing in the way. They like to run the ABC down and run it out of town and run it out of business. And then they've had complete control. I mean, there'll be some in the Liberal Party, the National Party, that would say, no, that's not true. No, that's absolutely not true. But the, the ideology is to destroy all questioning opposition. And just by the way, the point of the theme of China and Hong Kong is a little bit rich, considering what's been happening with Assange and the failure to stand up for somebody who does hold truth to power. The answer to your question is, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that by having robust, healthy, open discussions like this and talking about these issues can actually make people think about what kind of country they want to be in and to, to, to wrestle with those problems. You're absolutely right, and I think we also need leaders who are big enough to um, say, you know what, I think that's that was a mistake. I think we can do things differently, yeah. and with the courage to stand up to our to our allies, um, yeah, because we, we 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 just we don't have that. No, we don't have that. We don't have that, but we're about to see America. Um, maybe not disintegrated in my lifetime, but it seems to be pretty wobbly at the moment. And, uh, and how are we going to manage this um, sort of uh, step away from engaging with, with China? Um, Australia just needs to be more independent. And as Hugh White, a passing jab at people who want to be more independent, it said, said words to the effect, well, if you want to be independent, you're going to have to pay another two and a half cent your GDP. Well, I don't know, but that's part of the debate. Do we want more independence so that we're not in, in, involved in foreign wars, in foreign wars with the British, in foreign wars with the Americans, or in a foreign war with the Chinese? I mean, that's the sort of position you've got to get to to engage the public and talk to them about the honesty of where we stand here. And, and understanding why we enter foreign wars is yeah. so important. And many of WikiLeaks releases mm -hmm. enable us to do exactly that, as uh, Professor Fernandez has, has um, summarised so well in his book, What I'm Sam Watts, yeah. uh, uh, which really gives us insight into American foreign policy and, and how Australian foreign policy is linked to that. We need, uh, as a public, to understand all of that. Um, look, thank you very much, Andrew. It's been a, a great discussion. I wish there was some. Uh, I'm sure people listening wish that there, you know, there were other questions that could have been um, answered. But I think we're going to have to um, stop it. Stop it there. Good luck um, with the book. I hope that um, you know the launching of your updated book is going to uh, focus on this very, very important issue, but not just personally for Julian, but also for us as a society. Thanks very much, Mary. Thank you.